Adam and Eve. According to the scriptures, Adam was created from the dust of the ground. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. And Eve was created from the rib of Adam. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs, and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman, and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones, and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. So what did Adam and Eve look like? According to the narrative, Adam was created from the dust of the ground, and the name Adam actually means red ground, red dirt, red clay, and red earth, etc. Adam literally means red, and there is an etymological connection between Adam and Adama, Adama designating red clay or red ground in a non-theological context. According to Abram publications, Adama means red ground or red earth. With that being said, could Adam and Eve look like red soil, red clay, and red earth? I believe this is one method we can use to determine what Adam and Eve may have looked like, considering that Adam is also referred to as meaning red man. According to gotquestions.org, what is the meaning of the Hebrew word Adama? The Hebrew word Adama means land, ground, or soil. The word Adama could then be more literally translated as red ground, and the name Adam could be said to mean red man, or man from the red dirt. According to NGDI Resource Center, Adama, the word for the ground is Adama, and of course the first human is called Adam. It perfectly fits the scene of God forming Adam from the Adama, and the fact that Adam's skin is red, Adam, in Hebrew, like the ground. According to readers ask what does Adam mean in the Bible, a well-known Hebrew name, Adam, meaning son of the red earth. Its meaning comes from the Hebrew word Adama, meaning earth, from which Adam is said to be formed. What does Adam mean in Greek? From Latin Adam, Adamus, from ancient Greek, Adomos, from biblical Hebrew, Adam, earth, man, soil, light brown, from Adama, red earth, ground. What does Adam mean in Latin? Masculine, proper name, biblical name of the first man, progenitor of the human race, from Hebrew, Adam, man, literally the one formed from the ground, Hebrew, Adama, ground, compare Latin, homo, man, humanus, human, hummus, earth, ground, soil. Does Adam mean man in Hebrew? Meaning and history. This is the Hebrew word for man. It could be ultimately derived from Hebrew Adam, meaning to be red, referring to the ruddy color of human skin, or from Akkadian Adamu, meaning to make. So if you take a look at red dirt, red clay, red ground, and red earth, it seems to have a reddish brown look and red seems to be close to the brown family of colors. Therefore, if Adam and Eve was created from the red dirt and red clay, and if red earth has a brownish red color, and Adam's name can literally mean red man, I would posit that Adam and Eve had a 
reddish brown complexion. As an example, Adam would look much like this man with a reddish brown skin tone that matches the dirt he's surrounded by. Eve would look much like this woman who's actually wearing a red clay face mask, but as we can see, her skin tone actually matches the red clay being a reddish brown skin tone. Cain and Abel and the rest of Adam's early descendants will look like these two boys who have a clear reddish brown complexion. But let's take a scientific approach according to biology and genetics of what Adam and Eve and early man would have looked like according to both a secular and a biblical science approach. Copyright Disclaimer Under Title 17 USC Section 107, allowance is made for fair use for purposes such as criticism, comment, news reporting, teaching, scholarship, and research. Fair use is permitted by copyright statute that might otherwise be infringing. Nonprofit, educational, or personal use tips the balance in favor of fair use. Jefferson may look European, but his Y chromosome tells a different story. It shows that what we look like may not really tell us where we come from. And it raises a question mark over the traditional image of Adam. For centuries, artists have depicted him like this, like a European. For many of us, this is Adam. Michelangelo's famous painting in the Vatican Sistine Chapel. He looks like a beautiful Italian who spends a lot of time in the gym. Did the common ancestor of all men really look like this? The story of Jefferson suggests he could have looked very different. Finally, Wells comes face to face with the man he's been searching for. A new portrait of the common ancestor of every man today. Adam. Without a skull, we can't know for sure what Adam looked like. But a combination of genetic evidence, Bender's forensic skills, and cutting-edge computer software suggest he looks something like this. Thousands of years after the Bible, and hundreds of years after Michelangelo, we have a whole new face for Adam. I like the expression. He's got a very forceful look. You know, he's intent on something, maybe taking over the world. You, know, you begin to get perhaps an insight into why these guys won out and why this guy's our ancestor. I hear this one a lot. How can there be so many races in the world if we are all descendants of Adam and Eve? Well, check this out. First off, let's talk about the word race. Sometimes when people use the word, they mean supposed races of people who have evolved at different times, rates, and in different locations. That's not true. Of course, the word race is also a term we use to distinguish between groups with different physical traits, namely skin color. But are there really different races? Take a gander at Acts 17.26 where it is written that God, from one man, made every nation of men. It's clear then that the Bible teaches that there is one race, the human race. The Bible is also clear that all people on the earth are descendants of Adam and Eve who were created by God. Check Genesis 1, 26 through 28. Easy enough. God created two people in his image, male and female, and told them to increase in number. So Adam and Eve are mom and dad of the human race. Then their children had children, and those children had children, and so on and so forth for many generations until, according to Genesis 6, 9, the world's population was reduced to eight people who were protected inside an ark during a global flood. And those eight people later walked off the ark, and according to Genesis 9, 19, from them came the people who were scattered over the earth. Oh, wait a second. What do I mean scattered? Well, jump over to Genesis 11 and let's talk about an event known as the Tower of Babel. Basically, because of the sinful actions of the descendants of Noah, the Lord confused their language and scattered them from there over all the earth. That's pretty clear and concise. Okay, so we've got lots of people who are descendants of the eight folks who came off the ark, and now they have been scattered all over the earth. That explains that we are still one race and that different groups of people ended up in different locations. But how do we get a bunch of different colored people if we are all one race? 
Well, follow along. This, of course, is a simplified explanation, but the basic principles are true. We all have a pigment in our bodies called melanin, which, depending on different variables, produces different shades of the one main skin color we all possess. Several genes control the amount of melanin produced and thus the variability in the skin shade. In fact, it's easy for one couple to produce a wide range of skin shade variability in just one generation, as we'll see in just a moment. Time for a quick genetics lesson. DNA is the molecule of heredity that is passed from parents to children. A child inherits 23 chromosomes from each parent. Each chromosome pair contains hundreds of genes which regulate the physical development of the child. However, to illustrate basic genetic principles pertaining to the topic, we'll just talk about two genes, the genes that control the production of melanin. So, let capital A and capital B symbolize versions of the gene that code for large amounts of melanin, while little a and little b code for small amounts. Got it? Easy. Check this out. Take a look at the upper left. Let's say dad contributes capital A, capital B genes, and mom contributes capital A, capital B genes as well. Together they will produce a child with capital A, capital A, capital B, and capital B. This is a kid with a lot of melanin, and thus he will have very dark skin. Easy to see. Here's the bigger point though. Let's say dad contributes capital A, capital B, and mom contributes little a and little b. Well, the child's skin will be middle brown shade, the combination of capital A, little a, and capital B, little b, which by the way represents a majority of the world's population. Not only that, but if each parent is capital A, little a, capital B, little b, the combinations that could be produced in their children could result in a very wide range of skin shades in just one generation. So. Since Adam and Eve were the first people ever, it makes sense to conclude that God placed in them a combination of genes that could produce all different shades of skin we see. Those same combinations would be present in Noah and the seven other people who boarded the ark. And because God dispersed people at the Tower of Babel, he dispersed the population, thereby isolating gene pools in the different people groups. Over time, different cultures formed in different locations with certain features like skin shade becoming predominant. And here we are today. And since we all go back to Noah and his family, it makes sense that we are all different shades of brown. One race, multiple people groups, just like the Bible teaches. Simplified for sure, but enough said. It's pretty clear that Adam and Eve and early mankind would have been dark-skinned in the past. What I find fascinating about the young earth creation perspective of Adam and Eve having medium brown skin is that it's very similar to the idea of Adam and Eve being reddish brown, which is also part of the medium brown family of colors. With all of that being said, I subscribe to the idea that Adam would have had a medium brown reddish skin tone and Eve would have also had a medium brown reddish skin tone. That being said, does all of mankind today descend from Adam and Eve? Well according to the scriptures that is yes. From Genesis to Revelations the scriptures make it clear that mankind descends from Adam and Eve. And so it is written the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. And hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth, and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation. And Adam called his wife's name Eve, because she was the mother of all living. According to Acts chapter 17 verse 26, it says that from one blood every nation of man to dwell on all the face of the earth. And 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse 25 says that Adam was the first man. And Genesis chapter 3 verse 20 says that Eve is the mother of all living. If all men come from Adam, and if Eve is the mother of all living, this basically makes Adam and Eve the parents of us all, despite the way we may look today. Even modern science understands this fact, that all of mankind has a common ancestor, a scientific Adam and Eve. Our ancient connections may not be obvious to this group. Our ancestors adapted to different climates, and as a result, humans are now among the most physically varied looking species on the planet. But looks can be deceiving. We're basically identical at the genetic level. I mean, if you, you look at the average person's DNA sequence and compare the same region to another person they're unrelated to, you know, they're 99.9% .9 identical. All that, there. 
Look right here. This is great. Light, dark, big, small, curly, straight, brown, blue. Minuscule genetic changes account for all of our differences. To track our ancient paths, though, scientists study DNA that stays very much the same. In men like George Dellis, it's a Y chromosome. All that. Let's do one more. It's been passed down the line from father to son over thousands of generations. And ultimately traces back to one man who lived in Africa around 60,000 years ago. Call him Scientific Adam. He wasn't the only guy alive back then, but only his Y chromosome survived through the ages. And every man alive today has a copy. For women like Nejla Demerji, the DNA comes from special cell structures called mitochondria, which both men and women carry, but only moms pass along. These trace back to one woman who also lived in Africa between 150 to 200,000 years ago. Call her Scientific Eve. She is the oldest root of our family tree. Africa is where the journey begins for everyone alive today. So even according to science, all of humanity has a common ancestor, which is exactly what the scriptures have been saying for thousands of years. Even from a theological or spiritual understanding, all of mankind has to descend from Adam and Eve. Because according to the scriptures, death entered the world through Adam. And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And the Lord God took the man and put him into the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. Chapter 3 Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, Hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together, and made themselves aprons. And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it, cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return unto the ground. For out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. And Adam called his wife's name Eve, because she was the mother of all living. Unto Adam also, and to his wife, did the Lord God make coats of skins, and clothed them. And the Lord God said, Behold, the man is become as one of us to know good and evil. And now, lest he put forth his hand, and take also of the tree of life, and eat, and live forever, 
Therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. So he drove out the man, and he placed at the east of the garden of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. And all the days that Adam lived were nine hundred and thirty years, and he died. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who was the figure of him that was to come. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. All of mankind has to descend from Adam and Eve because death entered the world through Adam. I don't believe that other humans existed before or during Adam and Eve's creation. For people that believe other humans existed before Adam, often dubbed pre-Adamites, then I have this question. Do these pre-Adamites partake in the curse of death that Adam and Eve received after eating from the forbidden fruit? Because according to the narrative, it's only after you ate from the forbidden fruit that you would die. But if these pre-Adamites didn't eat from the fruit, then why do they deserve death? And what happened is when God created Adam uh, and he sinned, he fell, that errors came into the code. The master programmer endowed us with perfect code, and only at the fall of man did it become corrupted. So the chemical code built on A, G, T, and C becomes corrupted as a result of the shuffling of the order of those bits or a loss of one or more bits. And Adam, as a father of the race and a direct creation of God, had a perfect code. There was no loss of data or corruption of the data in any way. And it was when he found that those things in some way got scrambled or they lost some data or something uh, happened there where there was a loss of information. And John Sanford puts it this way. He says the extinction of the human genome appears to be just as certain and deterministic as the extinction of stars, the death of organisms, and the heat death of the universe. So uh, he's discovered, and, and others have as well, that the entire human race is about 50% dead. We're on our way to extinction as a race. And because there are more and more mutations that continue to get into our genome, uh, you really are more of a mutant than your parents in case you're wanting your children are more mutant than you are. So it's not just some feeling that you had, but it's true. They really are more mutant. But uh, we are, we're all mutant. We're all mutating and we're losing information. Well, during normal conception, not looking at the, the, the miraculous conception at this point, uh, during reproduction, the maternal and paternal gametes, that is the haploid cells, fuse at conception to produce a zygote, which will turn into a fetus and eventually into an adult human being. And when two gametes unite during fertilization, each contributes its haploid set of chromosomes to the new individual, restoring the diploid number. So we can essentially look at it this way. Now, there's something else that happened that is quite astounding. We know that sin came through Adam, and as a result of sin, death. Death spread to everything because of his sin. And we refer to this as the original sin. Well, it turns out that a son will inherit an identical copy of his father's Y chromosome, and this copy is also essentially identical to the Y chromosomes carried by all his paternal forefathers across the generations. We also read a man, a male shares the same Y chromosome with his father, paternal grandfather, paternal great-grandfather, and so on. So according to Neil Bradman and Mark Thomas, who are incidentally uh, committed evolutionists, uh, they don't believe in, in God or anything of this stuff, but they actually rewrote Genesis chapter 5 in modern terms. They say, Genesis chapter 5 records the generations of Adam. Adam begot Seth, Seth begot Enosh, etc., down to Noah of the flood. <coughs> Translated into modern genetic terms, the account could read, Adam passed a copy of his Y chromosome to Seth, Seth passed a copy of his Y chromosome to Enosh, Enosh passed a copy of his Y chromosome to Kenan, and so on until Noah was born carrying a copy of Adam's Y chromosome. Now this becomes very fascinating when we consider that, uh, still according to these guys, they say that they're... Um, the Y chromosome may in fact be a record of an event in the life of our original father. Bradman and Thomas suggest that the Y chromosome contains a record of an event in the life of the man who passed on the current Y chromosome, which they say had no effect on the life of the man in whom the change occurred, nor indeed on the life of his descendants. 
However, is it possible that the recorded event is not something that had little or no effect, but is in some way the record of the genetic fall of our first father? And obviously I argue that that is indeed the case. Uh, as evolutionists, they would say, well, it had no big deal because they believe that death has been part of the process of life from the beginning. But from the Bible we read that death only came as a result of Adam's fall. So I believe that what we're seeing here is that just as Adam passed on a copy of his Y chromosome to each of his sons, which means, guys, that each one of us has a copy of Adam's Y chromosome. But guess what Jesus didn't have? Jesus didn't have that Y chromosome. He did not have a copy of Adam's Y chromosome. So I believe that the Y chromosome is in some way carrying uh, the original sin, if you will. And since he did not get that, he did not inherit uh, whatever was in there, he, uh, he didn't get that from Adam, but he got it, of course, directly from the Holy Spirit. Something else that is fascinating to consider is that through the disobedience of Adam, all creation was made subject to corruption. Uh, we know, according to Dr. Robert Gentry and others, uh, that in granite rocks, there's something called polonium, and it releases, at least it did in the past, it doesn't still do it, but it released something called an alpha particle, and when that alpha particle escaped, it made that granite slightly radioactive. So for those of you that have granite countertops, you really could take a Geiger counter and you get a very faint reading, uh, but there is radioactivity uh, coming out of your granite countertops. And what that means, if there's radioact radiation coming from that, even if it's very, very small, it means that something happened at the fall because we read in Gen or, excuse me, Romans 8 for the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God for the creation was subjected to futility not willingly but because of him who subjected it in hope because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God for we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pains together until now even we ourselves groan within ourselves eagerly waiting for the adoption and redemption of our body so God made the earth, he made the Adama, which is the soil, and then he made Adam, Adam, out of the Adama. So Adam becomes this earth man, if you will. Remember, God makes the dust, then he takes the dust, he forms it, he breathes his spirit in there, and then Adam becomes really the representative or federal head of everything that's connected. God said, let the earth bring forth all the living creatures. He also said, of course, concerning the, the oceans and the waters, let them bring forth uh, living creatures and so on. So Adam was the only one that God created directly. And now as the earth man, whatever happens to Adam happens to the earth. So when Adam sinned, that decay, corruption, death entered into his body. And as a result, it was spread and was passed on to all of creation. And so I would argue that there was no such thing as entropy, the second law of thermodynamics, uh, you know, getting old and that stuff before the fall. That was even the, the radiation that we find in the rocks was a result of Adam's fall. Because according to this text, the creation is going to be delivered from that. It was subjected to that. It wasn't made that way, but it happened as a result of Adam's fall. So what needs to happen is we need to be reborn with the seed of the Messiah, and when we are restored, then the whole creation is going to be restored. And that will ultimately happen in the millennium. All of mankind has to descend from Adam and Eve because death entered the world through Adam. I don't believe that other humans existed before or during Adam and Eve's creation. For people that believe other humans existed before Adam, often dubbed pre-Adamites, then I have this question. Do these pre-Adamites partake in the curse of death that Adam and Eve received after eating from the forbidden fruit? Because according to the narrative, it's only after you ate from the forbidden fruit that you would die. But if these pre-Adamites didn't eat from the fruit, then why do they deserve death? And the same goes for birth pains. According to the scriptures, Eve would receive birth pains after she ate from the forbidden fruit. Unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. And the same goes for birth pains. According to the scriptures, Eve would receive birth pains after she ate from the forbidden fruit. So why do 
other races or ethnicities also have birth pains if other races or ethnicities descend from these pre-Adamites? Shouldn't only the Adamic people receive these curses of death or birth pains? You begin to have a lot of issues if you believe that only one branch of humanity descends from Adam and Eve and other races or ethnicities descend from these pre-Adamites. Especially in light of DNA which proves that all of humanity descends from a common ancestor, a scientific Adam and Eve which fits perfectly with the biblical Adam and Eve. I definitely believe that all of humanity would descend from Adam and Eve. It makes sense genetically because all humans have a Y DNA and mitochondrial DNA chromosome. And it makes sense spiritually since every human on this earth dies due to Adam's sin from eating from the fruit. Now some people might ask if there was no other humans on the planet and if Adam and Eve only had Cain, Abel, and Seth. Then who did Seth marry and have kids with, and who did Cain marry and have kids with? Well, according to the scriptures, Adam and Eve actually had sons and daughters. Furthermore, Adam lived to be 900 years old. Chapter 5 This is the book of the generations of Adam. In the day that God created man, in the likeness of God made he him. Male and female created he them, and blessed them, and called their name Adam in the day when they were created. And Adam lived an hundred and thirty years, and begat a son in his own likeness after his image, and called his name Seth. And the days of Adam after he had begotten Seth were eight hundred years, and he begat sons and daughters. And all the days that Adam lived were nine hundred and thirty years, and he died. So Adam and Eve had sons and daughters. Furthermore, Adam lived to be over 900 years old. Within that time frame of 900 years, Adam and Eve could have had many, many children. So relatives would have married each other back then in the pre-flood world, and it was okay. Keep in mind, there was no Levitical law against it yet because the Israelites didn't exist at the time. Furthermore, genetically, Adam and Eve and all of early man would have been the purest humans that you could be. After all, Adam and Eve lived to be over 900 years old, and their descendants lived for centuries after him. Furthermore, the pre-flood world environment was completely different and healthier than today. With all of that being said, there would have been no genetic deformities if relatives got together. These pre-flood humans were very different than modern humans today after the flood. The flood changed the old world. This next video will explain what pre-flood humans may have been like. So who did Adam's sons marry? And who was Seth's wife? We read in Genesis 5, 4, And the days of Adam after he had begotten Seth were 800 years. And he begat sons and daughters. So after Seth was born to Adam, Adam went on to have many more sons and daughters over a period of 800 years. The book of Genesis tells us that Adam lived a total of 930 years. He could have had a ton of children in 930 years. So the simple answer is that Adam's sons married their sisters. Adam's sons married their sisters because, first of all, there was no other choice. No one would have thought it was wrong. And who are you going to report them to, anyway? They were the only people in the world. Also, there were no laws against it until 2,500 years later. There was no need for the law until then. They did not need laws against this to start out with because the human race had virtually no defects. It was perfect at the beginning. But over the next 2,000 years or so, it slowly became a problem. So God gave the law prohibiting the marrying of sisters in the book of Leviticus in chapter 18. And by that time, there was no need to marry sisters anyway because there were plenty of people on the planet. Number one, they would have a pure gene pool. No defective chromosomes. A gene, in case you don't know, is if you took a ladder 
an extension ladder from here to Chicago, about 900 miles, and you had somebody stand on the other end while you started twisting it here. You twisted and twisted and twisted and twisted. By the time it gets all twisted up from here to Chicago, that would be what's roughly what a chromosome looks like. Your, each cell in your body has 46 of those little chromosomes. The rung of the ladder would be a gene. So the illustration people use is, is a twisted ladder, pretty tough to draw, uh, 2D, what a 3D ladder would look like twisted. But each of these things across here is a rung of the ladder. Each of those is called a gene. The whole thing is called a chromosome or a DNA strand, deoxyribonucleic acid. The same thing as a chromosome, deoxyribonucleic acid. And this thing right across here is one gene, G-E-N-E, H2. -E -E, but when, during uh, conception for the baby, half of this chromosome comes from the mother and half comes from the father. The problem is it splits down the middle. Now let's take a ladder that is twisted from here to Chicago. We're going to split it all the way down the middle. It's going to unwind itself and it's going to get the other half of the ladder from the mother or father, depending what your case may be, and it's going to wind itself back together and all those genes are going to line up. Absolutely phenomenal how this can happen. And that's one chromosome. You've got 46 that are doing this. 46 chromosomes in every cell of your body. But the re one of the reasons they lived to be 900 before the flood was they had a pure gene pool. No genetic load. You've got about 4,000 of these genes in your gene code that are defective. Sort of like a computer program where something's wrong. Anyway, the uh, people were living long before the flood. They had no defective chromosomes in the original creation, number one. Number two, they had a canopy of water to protect them, to filter out the radiation from the sun. Number three, they're eating a perfect diet. They're also eating food that has been unaffected by any of this harmful stuff. Plus, they're eating food grown in soil that is not depleted at all, mineral-rich soil. I think in the original creation, they had perfect food supply, perfect atmosphere to breathe, uh, no genetic load. They had probably several reasons why they were living to be 900 years old. So the chemical code built on A, G, T, and C becomes corrupted as a result of the shuffling of the order of those bits or a loss of one or more bits. And Adam, as a father of the race and a direct creation of God, had a perfect code. There was no loss of data or corruption of the data in any way. And it was when he fell that those things in some way got scrambled or they lost some data or something uh, happened there where there was a loss of information. And so I would argue that there was no such thing as entropy, the second law of thermodynamics, uh, you know, getting old and that stuff before the fall. But I think before the flood came, they had this canopy of air or of water or ice that would increase air pressure. Plus, they had richer oxygen. You know, when they drill into the amber, how many saw the movie Jurassic Park, you know, where they drilled in to get the mosquito blood out? Sometimes in amber, which is petrified tree sap, they find air bubbles in the amber. When they analyze the air bubbles, they find out they're 50% more oxygen than we have today. Today we're breathing 21% oxygen. Amber bubbles have 32% oxygen. Did you know if you lived in a world with double the air pressure and 50% more oxygen, just breathing would be exciting. Adam would go, wow, that was fun. <laughs> hey, Eve, let's do that again. Ready, go. The earth had more oxygen in the past than it does now. But if you double the air pressure and increase oxygen, not only does your hemoglobin take on oxygen like it's supposed to, <clears throat> your plasma will get oxygen saturated, which means you could run hundreds of miles without getting tired. Well, man, in the pre-flood world, if they had to double the air pressure and increased oxygen, you would just be full of energy all the time. There's a guy in Japan started raising tomato plants with pressurized carbon dioxide. You know, plants breathe CO2, not oxygen. His tomato plant grew faster than normal, when it was two years old, it was nine, uh, 14, 16 feet tall and produced 900 tomatoes. They moved it to a shopping center and built scaffolding to hold the branches up. They said, you know, this thing might produce 10,000 tomatoes. This is uh, one tomato plant. It ended up growing 40 feet tall and producing 15,000 tomatoes off of one plant. They were, it was a cherry tomato plant, but they were, his tomatoes were coming off baseball size off of his. A guy in Iowa got curious, you know, why do the birds start chirping an hour before sunrise? He found out the chirping of the birds is a certain frequency that opens up the stomata on the leaf cells. You know, the leaf, if you look underneath with the magnifying glass, it's got these little holes in there that open up to let the CO2 come in. It wakes the leaf up in the morning. 
Well, he discovered that this frequency is found quite a bit in classical music. So he started playing Beethoven and Bach and Chopin to his cornfield. His neighbors thought, you know, un poquito loco a la cabeza, you know. He's about a half a bubble off a plum or something, you know. But cheese done fell out of his sandwich. Anyway, they thought he was nuts until his corn grew 15 feet tall. He played it to his squash plants, and they grew, they grew five squash per leaf instead of one. He played it to his black walnut tree, and it grew twice as fast as normal. He, his potatoes got t double or triple normal potato size. His cantaloupe were the size of soccer balls. He called it sonic bloom. formation. But the Bible says there were herbs, that's plants, over all the earth. It's not that way today. 70% of the earth is underwater, for heaven's sake. Okay, that's not covered with plants. The earth was covered with plants when God made it. Did you know they find leaves in Antarctica? 250 miles from the South Pole, they're finding leaves. There are no trees in the South Pole. 70% of the earth today is underwater. Did you know only 3% of this earth is habitable for mankind? A lot of it's under desert, ice caps, tundra, mountain ranges nobody can live on. 3% is habitable. What we're seeing today is not what Adam and Eve saw. The Bible says he formed it to be inhabited. That's why he did it. Probably the pre-flood world was, I would just be picking a number and say probably 80% land and only 20% water. The oceans weren't there. They, the water was in the crust of the earth or in the canopy overhead. But there, was, there were trees from pole to pole before the flood came. This layer of water above the earth would act as a barrier that would block out UV light and x-rays and other harmful things that come from the sun. See, the sun produces a lot of stuff besides light. It produces x-rays and gamma rays and beta rays, and all them ray boys come down here, and they're pretty hard on your carcass. X-rays particularly are dangerous. How many have ever had an x-ray before? I broke nine bones growing up. My brother broke 21. <laughs> we played rough in our neighborhood. One of my neighbors shot his brother through the leg with a crossbow. He said, I didn't know it was loaded. How can you not know a crossbow is loaded? Oh, duh. Anyway, you go to the hospital and they say, take off all your clothes and put this little gown on. You put this little gown on, you know, and they say, no, it doesn't, quite, it doesn't quite come together in the back. You know, it's kind of embarrassing. And then they say, now walk down the hall about 12 miles and you'll see the x-ray room. Well, if you make it all that way, they'll say, oh, we're so glad you made it. Would you please lay on this table? And they just got the table out of the freezer a few minutes before you got there. How many been on that same table? Now, you know what I'm talking about? It's ice cold. And he puts this weird machine on top of you, and the doctor says, okay, now take a deep breath and hold it. And he runs out in the hall. <laughs> and he's got a lead apron on. You say, Doc, come here. Is this machine dangerous? He says, no, it's harmless. He's lying. You say, Doc, how does this machine work? He says, well, when I mash the button, x-ray bullets come out of that machine, and they're going to go right through your body like a machine gun, and we're going to blow you full of holes, billions of them, little tiny x-ray holes. We're going to actually make a shadow of what's inside your body, which, by the way, is why many radiologists have a negative outlook on life. <clears throat> but we're going to blow you full of holes. But he knows it's dangerous for long-term exposure to x-rays, so that's why he's got the lead apron and runs out behind the lead wall. He don't want to get exposed to those x-rays. But a lot of people don't realize the sun x-rays us every day. We're being x-rayed right now. Now, concrete will stop x-rays and water will stop x-rays, but this roof on this church will not stop x-rays. They're coming right through the roof and right through your body. And you're being x-rayed as you sit there. Not a thing you can do about it. Well, I'll tell you in a minute what you can do about it. But your skin feels the full force of these x-rays. And your body has to fix the damage. I mean, you fix millions of holes in your skin every single day. Millions of them. And after 50 or 60 years, or 70 or 80 for sure, everybody around you starts to notice you are losing the battle for damage control. Your skin begins to wrinkle up. You say, well, Brother Hovind, I don't want to get old and wrinkled. I'm sorry. If you get old, you're going to get wrinkled, okay? You might as well get ready for it. But that didn't happen before the flood. The Bible says before the flood came, they lived to be over 900 years old and probably didn't wrinkle. I buried that world. God not only told them what to do and how to live before the flood, He also told them what to eat. He gave them a perfect diet. God said, I want you to eat the herbs, kids, eat your vegetables, the fruit, 
and the seeds. Genesis 1.29. We don't do that much. We eat the hamburger, french fries, and coke. God said eat the fruit, vegetables, and seeds. When you eat the fruit, you should eat the seed. When you eat a peach, eat the seed. You say, that thing's hard. Well, crack it open with a hammer. The seed is inside the hull, okay? And by the way, there's a good book. A lady saw my seminar, got all excited, went on a Garden of Eden diet, and totally revolutionized her health, and wrote a good book on that, Following the Eden Diet, if you want to get that. You're right to be beautiful. But uh, you should eat the seed. Now, be sure to get organically grown seeds, not the ones raised on steroids and pesticides. But the seeds contain a bitter substance called cyanide that will give you a pucker that will last about an hour and a half. Some of you old-timers are looking at me like, uh, pucker, pucker, what is that for? Man, I used to know. My dad says, you know, you're getting old when you get all the way across the room to give your wife a kiss, and then you forgot why you came. Yep, you're getting old, Dad. <laughs> but these seeds contain a vitamin called vitamin B17, which is half cyanide. They say, oh, that's poison. No, it's not either. Hydrogen's explosive. Ask the folks on the Hindenburg, they found out. And oxygen supports combustion. Now, who in their right mind would spray hydrogen and oxygen on a fire to try to put it out? Every fireman on the planet. What do you get if you mix hydrogen and oxygen? Water. Okay. Sodium is poisonous. Chlorine is poisonous. You mix them together, you get salt, which is perfectly wonderful. So the cyanide found in the seeds is mixed with benzaldehyde. Both are poison, but together they're harmless until they bump into a cancer cell. There's a book about this topic called World Without Cancer. Plenty of websites about that topic. If you want to read more, there's a bunch of stuff there on the screen and on my website, drdino.com. There's a tribe of folks in northern Pakistan called the Hunza. The Hunza people never get cancer. When the tribe was first discovered, their average age was 160. This is one of the valleys up there in the Himalaya Mountains. This led to the legend of Shangri-La. How many have ever heard of the Valley of Shangri-La, the valley where you live forever? Well, they didn't live forever, but they lived an awfully long time. The Hunza people's favorite food to eat is apricot seeds. Now, today they typically live to be about 90. They've had a lot of contact with the outside world. But apricot seeds are kind of interesting. They take the apricot seeds and squeeze them and get oil out of them. They put the oil on their skin and the women don't wrinkle. They're really good looking at 70 and 80. Hunzas eat these apricot seeds like we eat peanuts. They just love them. And they never get cancer. You know, people that take nutritional therapy to cure cancer have a much better survival rate. Now, they don't all still survive, I understand, okay? But it's about 10 times the opportunity to live than it is from taking the conventional therapies. There's plenty of good books on this topic. Jason Vale uh, teaches... You should eat apricot seeds to cure cancer. And he said, cancer cannot survive in a body of a person that consumes apricot seeds. Jason Vale simply recommended that people eat apricot seeds, and they arrested him and put him in jail. He's still in jail now for telling people to eat apricot seeds. Because the FDA wants people to take drugs to get well, not seeds to get well, because they can't regulate seeds. They can't make money off of it. It all goes back to money. You know, follow the yellow brick road. Uh, the money trail. For years, sailors died of a horrible disease called scurvy. The British Navy lost a million sailors to scurvy. Does anybody know how they cured scurvy? Vitamin C. They didn't even know about vitamin C. They just knew if you eat limes, you don't get it. They called them the limeys, didn't they? Take vitamin, take, take limes on board. Many diseases that we get today are caused by a deficiency of a vitamin. It's not what you're eating that's killing you. It's what you're not eating that's killing you. If you don't get enough berry, uh, vitamin B, you get berry, berry, pellagra, rickets. All those are vitamin deficiency diseases. The Bible says God gave herb for the service of man and bread to strengthen man's heart. Did you know bread used to strengthen your heart? But keep in mind, you know, the love of money, root of all evil... They learned years ago, if they take out the vitamin E, the lecithin, and the omega-3 fatty acids, they take them out of the wheat, make the bread with white flour, the bread lasts for months. But the people started dying of heart attacks and strokes and circulation problems. See, it's a simple formula. The whiter the bread, the quicker you're dead. <clears throat> 
Now, it's not the white bread that's killing you. It's what's not in the bread that's killing you. See, God made bread to strengthen your heart. And if you need, remember the Bible talked about our daily bread? But people who were making bread to sell got tired of having half of it go bad on the shelf where they couldn't sell it. So they had to figure out a way to make the bread last longer to increase profits. It all goes back to money. Follow the yellow brick road. There are two philosophies of health. One is based upon evolution, which says your body is nothing but chemicals that got together by chance over billions of years. So you, to treat diseases, you add more chemicals. It's called drug therapy. If you have a headache, you say, Doctor, I have a headache. He says, here, take an aspirin. Well, now hold on a minute. What caused your headache? Was it the lack of an aspirin that caused your headache? Are you suffering from an aspirin deficiency? Aren't you treating the symptom instead of the cause? I mean, think about it. See, if you're driving down the highway and the oil light comes on your car, you've got two choices. Find the problem and fix it, or unplug the light. You say, you would never unplug the light. That'd be stupid. Yes, I know that'd be stupid. The light's not the problem. The light's trying to tell you about a problem. And believe it or not, your headache is not your problem. Your headache's trying to tell you about a problem. Deficiency in magnesium, maybe, or protein, I don't know. But most of the drugs that we take today are to unplug lights. They're not to fix problems. They're to fix symptoms. And sometimes that's necessary. I'm not against drugs all the time, but I'm telling you folks, we've gone nuts. Drug companies don't make money when you're well. And the love of money is the root of all evil. Most diseases are deficiency diseases. You're low in a vitamin or a mineral or an oil. There are 16 vitamins, 60 minerals, and 3 oils your body needs every day. Just give it plenty, okay? There's a good book by Bill Sardi, a friend of mine in California, called The Power of Healing, The Power of God. We're out of it on the table, but you can order that if you want to study more on health. Or get his other book, The Bible Prescription for Health and Longevity, uh, by Bill Sardi. And before you get excited about them putting fluoride in your water, you might want to read about the truth behind fluoride that they add to our water systems and how dangerous that is. In summary and conclusion, Adam and Eve and early man would have looked reddish brown in skin tone, and all of mankind descends from Adam and Eve, and the pre-flood world and pre-flood humans were completely different than today. With that being said, Shalom.